Nurturing new quality productive forces is one of the key goals of China's development this year and beyond. Now, the term refers to harnessing scientific and technological innovation to significantly boost economic productivity. The Chinese government work report illustrates this term in three aspects, upgrading industrial and supply chains, fostering emerging and future-oriented industries, and promoting innovation. During a delegation discussion at this year's two sessions, President Xi Jinping stressed the need to step up independent and original innovation to boost the country's new quality productivity. Now, for more insight into this, we're joined in the studio by Professor Liu Zhiqing from Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies at Renmin University of China and uh, Professor Wang Xingsong, visiting scholar at uh, Rajawali Foundation Institute for Asia at Harvard Kennedy School. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, gentlemen. Let me start with you, Professor Liu. We know uh, productiv productivity forces actually is a pillaring concept in Marxism, especially in historical materialism and uh, political economy. So it looks like the focus right now is more on the new quality part. What's your reading into this? Uh, as you mentioned, that this uh, concept, uh, uh, science and technologies are productive forces, is the uh, basic principle of Marxism. And also early in 1988, and uh, Deng Xiaoping has uh, reiterated again that science and technology are the first or the primary productive force. Now this is time has changing. Now we are coming to the new area with new challenges and new uncertainties. In order to deal with all these uh, uh, challenges and uh, problems that uh, we should have a new technology and a new science to promote our economy. This is the basic uh, meaning of the new of the idea. Why? Because we need a new technology. For in the past 20 years, all over the world, including China, technologies and innovations have been merged in many cases. So in this way, how to uh, emphasize and stimulate the new term of the productive force is very important. That's why we have new concept as new quality productive force. That means this Productive force is not originally as before. It should be with a high quality development, with a high quality concept, with high quality uh, technologies. So, for instance, the digitalization at the moment, I, in my opinion, is the most important the new technology. We should put more emphasis and more support to this area. Now, since you mentioned that, uh, we know President Xi Jinping also emphasized that uh, new quality productive forces are not something uh, happen overnight. Uh, it must be based on the given con conditions of a given environment. And he also said it's critical to transfer a technological innovation into real productive uh, forces. So what do you make of uh, the uh, transformation mechanism? Yeah, that's an important question because, as we know, the, from the productive forces, or including the traditional industries, normally we define that this in two sections: heavy industry, light industry. Nowadays, I think we should add the third, that the smart industry. What the meaning of smart industry? That's including new technologies. So this is the basic meaning, and the technical new concept advancing. This shows that the new quality productive force will have more uh, advantages and promotion, especially for to meet the demands of the people of the society, not only for the capital needs, because of 100 years before, this uh, idea mainly for to drive in the capital development. But nowadays, I think the main focus is on to improve and upgrade the people's life and the social equality. So this is the basic uh, advantage of our new quality productive force. So Professor Wang, uh, the strategy has been set. Policy-wise, what could be some of the imminently needed ones? Well, I think the innovation and technology-driven economy requires some sound policies, you know, some, some very generous uh, capital investments, but also very uh, sufficient supply of talents that can do R&D, that can really implement all these policies of promoting uh, the innovation-driven economy. And uh, in terms of talents, I think uh, China is uh, is cultivating a 
a very large number of college graduates who are trying to meet this expectation of the uh, of the new productive forces in our innovation driven economy but still there are challenges obviously you know uh, people are talking about you know the uh, unemployment rate for the youth but uh, the matter of fact is that uh, you still have a large number of jobs uh, waiting for graduates but there is a discrepancy or mismatching between the supply and uh, the supply of talents and the demands from the industry for example we're talking about 30 million manufacturing jobs that are waiting for uh, to be filled by uh, by by the graduates but uh, it seems that our education system is still struggling to uh, cultivate the needed uh, talents from the industry which means that there needs to be more collaboration between the industry and the education system so that their seamless collaboration can generate the talents that are needed by the industry and also talking about innovation driven economy you know we're entering really a new era where uh, the higher education system needs to uh, revamp its uh, educational paradigm and patterns so that, uh, that you know it would further encourage interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary collaboration uh, and research and think about AI research now uh, AI is being applied in various fields which requires not only computer scientists but also uh, experts from many other disciplines like biology, like chemistry, you know, like uh, 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 natural sciences in general. So overall, I think talent uh, can be a really important policy area that the Chinese government will work on uh, in the near future. Uh, Professor Liu, uh, the Chinese government has been encouraging uh, this synergy between the public and the private sectors to nurture more innovation. In this context, what role can the private sector play? I think a private sector can play a really very important role. In some cases, they will play a key role in the development. As we know, from the general speaking, China has 5,000 years civilization. This 5,000 civilization always based on the private economy. That shows that private economy has a really great power and the dynamic. So for innovation sections, as we know that the private company, they have three advantages, for instance, freedom, because they can have more freedom to make their own choice, make their own division. This is a very important priority for private company. Secondly, the, uh, the mobilize, uh, mobilization, because they are very easy to move from, the, from here to other places to make their uh, a choice to make uh, the business uh, advantages. Where they have uh, more advantages, they will go there. The, this is the second. And the third is uh, uh, another point is that their flexibility. Because the uh, private company, the three uh, advantages, including flexibility, make this uh, uh, economy very dynamic, very uh, lively, uh, uh, strong. So in this way, that we have to say that uh, to increase and strengthen the private sections is the key policy of a, uh, a government because it's compared to a public industry is so equal so important for both uh, what's your take on this professor Wang? let's also remember that a china's private economy promotion law is currently actually in a legislative process well, speaking of promoting the new productive forces, and simply the private sector represents the new and the most productive forces in the Chinese economy. And not only has it already contributed tremendously to the Chinese economy, but the, like Professor Liu just said, the private sector in China represents uh, the economic forces that are very flexible, that are very adaptive to the constant, constantly changing international market and economic and geopolitical uh, environments. And so this is a critical time when the Chinese government needs to uh, uh, you know, make serious uh, regulation, regulate, uh, regulation uh, reforms in order to promote a better environment for the private economy. And China is not alone. I mean, look at the major economies in the world. Everyone is trying to take fuller advantage of the most productive forces. And take the U.S. as an example.
the defense, the Department of Defense used to work only with the, you know, the largest contractors like the Marquis Lock, uh, 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 Martin Lockheed. But now uh, the most productive forces in terms of military innovative uh, technologies are happening in the Silicon Valley by the startup companies. So the DOD is making reforms and transition to work with the uh, newly uh, new, new startup companies in the Silicon Valley. So similarly, similarly, I think the Chinese government is doing, uh, you know, the right thing to take fuller advantage of the most productive forces in the Chinese economy, which is the private sector. And China is only going going faster than the U.S. on this regard. And this is where the promotion of private economy uh, uh, law is uh, comes in. I think it's going to provide the most important thing that's needed by the private sector right now, which is confidence. Uh, which is security that can be guaranteed by the state, by by the system, so that the private sector can, uh, you know, go as free as they want in terms of bring up more innovations and technological uh, technological advancements. Uh, Professor Liu, uh, what about foreign investment in China? We know so far China has lifted all restrictions on FDI in China's manufacturing sector, and more opening up measures are expected in the country's service. Uh, sector, what do you make of this momentum? Yeah, this is a good move, but not enough. I see that uh, to lift all the restrictions on foreign investment is the priority to attract more foreign investment. The second is that we should really create a very good, uh, very frank, very transparent uh, environment for doing business. This is very important because the Doing business uh, environment is not only the hardware, but also software that uh, we, uh, more or less uh, refer to the atmosphere. When the uh, doing business atmosphere is very friendly, very transparent, I think that could be a good reason that to attract more foreign investment to China. As we know that in the past 40 years, many foreign companies are eager to come to China because of two reasons. First is that China's the uh, environmental condition is very stable, not uh, with cows and turbulence all the time. So they feel very safe. This is a very important point. And the secondly, they are sure, they have confidence that, that to make profits very profitable for their investment in China. For these two reasons, that more and more foreign companies and investments are going to come to China. Of course, now in regional time, some companies and foreign investment made the adjustment to move in or move out. This is a very regular uh, situation. But we think in long run that China is uh, also a pool that to attract more investors to China in uh, the manufacturing, in science and the technology in order to have a close cooperation and a coordination with the Chinese partner. Because Without the Chinese creation of creative forces, I think in the world the other industry cannot develop very well. Also for China, we need also cooperation with the others. That's why we always say we should create a win-win atmosphere, win-win conditions. Uh, Professor Wang, uh, what you're reading into China's latest measures in promoting its high quality opening up, especially regarding another crucial issue, that is creating level playing field for all players. And this may lead to another crucial question, really. Uh, in Economics 101, if you have more players in the field, then eventually you will have more competition. Are both sides ready? Well, competition uh, is certainly uh, going to happen with, when you have more players um, uh, in, in a certain sector. But at the same time, competition promotes more innovation and more advancements, and that's exactly what's needed uh, by the world economy. And so I think China's continuous opening up and deepen opening up is going to benefit not only China, but the entire world economy. Uh, first of all, I think uh, Professor Liu has a very good point that the Chinese market is still the most attractive one in the world in terms of uh, not only its size, but also uh, is uh, is having the most comprehensive uh, supply chain and, and, and the top-notch infrastructure foundation that um, I don't think any other market uh, can, can match in terms of the uh, infrastructure and the supply chain that China has uh, has offered. But also the opening up also means China will continue to go out in terms of 
investing in overseas markets, which have already brought many benefits, not only to developed countries, but also to the global south. At the same time, I think China's continuous opening up also means that China is going to participate more actively, even more actively, in global governance, which is very much needed when we are facing many, many common threats. And overall, I think China also needs to watch out um, on, on some of the risks that you're, you have mentioned, Pandem, but also in terms of the, the imbalance, the trade relation, because we have already seen protect, protectionist policies from some major economies, and we, we're going to see more of that. Uh, so this is something that China needs to be cautious. Uh, I think overall, the point is still to uh, to strike a more balanced trade relationship, because after all, the objective is still to develop a more sustainable trade relationship with other major economies uh, rather than a short-term one. Thank you very much, Professor Wang Xingxiong and Professor Liu Zhiqing there. You're watching Global Watch on CGTN. Coming up, 